Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lesson on our subject STS-10. Now I want you to look at this photo. This photo shows the national headquarters of the Philippines Department of Science and Technology or DOST, which is located at Taguig Metro Manila. The Department of Science and Technology is the executive department of the Philippine government which is responsible for the coordination of science and technology-related projects in the Philippines and to formulate policies and projects in the fields of science and technology in support of national development. The need to develop a country's science and technology has generally been recognized as one of the imperatives of socioeconomic progress in the contemporary world. This has become a widespread concern of governments. Science and technology is closely associated with the country's political sovereignty and economic self-reliance. In this lecture, which is largely based on the article authored by Olivia C. Kowili, we will examine the history of science and technology in the Philippines. But rather than focusing on the chronology of events, we shall interpret and analyze the interdependent effects of geography, colonial trade, economic and educational policies, and sociocultural factors in shaping the evolution of present Philippine science and technology. Let us begin with the development of science and technology during the pre-colonial period. There is a very little reliable written information about Philippine society, culture, and technology before the arrival of the Spaniards in 1521. So, historians reconstruct a picture of this past using contemporary archaeological findings, accounts of by early traders and foreign travelers, and the narratives about conditions in the archipelago which were written by the first Spanish missionaries and colonial officials. This map shows the narrow land bridges connecting the Philippines to mainland Asia. According to archaeological sources, Homo sapiens from the Asian mainland first came overland and across narrow channels to live in Palawan and Batangas around 50,000 years ago. These Stone Age inhabitants subsequently formed settlements in the major Philippine islands such as in Mindanao, Negros, Samar, and Luzon. They made simple tools or weapons of stone flakes but eventually developed techniques for sawing, drilling, and polishing hard stones. By about 3000 BC, they were producing adsis ornaments of seashells and pottery of various designs. The manufacture of pottery subsequently became well-developed and flourished for about 2,000 years until it came into competition with Chinese porcelain. Thus, over time, pottery making declined. What has survived of this ancient technology is the lowest level, that is, the present manufacture of the ordinary cooking pot among several local communities. Gradually, the early Filipinos learned to make metal tools and implements using copper, gold, bronze, and later, iron. Excavations of Philippine graves and work sites have yielded iron slags. These suggest that Filipinos during this period engaged in the actual extraction of iron from ore, smelting, and refining. But it appears that the iron industry like the manufacture of pottery, did not survive the competition with imported cast iron from Malaysia and much later from China. By the first century AD, Filipinos were weaving cotton, smelting iron, making pottery and glass ornaments, and they were also engaged in agriculture. Lowland rice was cultivated in diked fields, and in the interior mountain regions, such as in the Cordillera, they made terraced fields which utilized spring water. Filipinos had also learned to build boats for the coastal trade. By the 10th century AD, this had become a highly developed technology. In fact, 
the early Spanish chroniclers took note of the refined warship called Caracoa. By the 10th century AD, early Filipinos also engaged in trading. For example, inhabitants of Butuan were trading with Champa, which is now known as Vietnam. The Filipinos in Mindanao and Sulu traded with Borneo, Malacca, and parts of the Malay Peninsula, while inhabitants of Mai or Mindoro traded with China. Chinese records, which now have been translated, contain a lot of references to the Philippines. These indicate that regular trade relations between the two countries had been well established during the 10th to the 15th centuries. Archaeological findings of Chinese porcelains made during this period that were excavated from various parts of the Philippines also support this contention. By the time the Spaniards came to colonize the Philippines, they found many scattered autonomous village communities all over the archipelago. These were kinship groups or social units rather than political units. The Spanish colonizers noted that all over the islands, Filipino communities were growing rice, vegetables, and cotton, raising swine, goats, and fowls. They were making wine, vinegar, and salt, weaving cloth, and producing beeswax uh, and honey. The Filipinos were also mining gold in such places as Panay, Mindoro, and Bicol. They wore colorful clothes, made their own gold jewelry, and even filled their teeth with gold. Their houses were made of wood or bamboo and nipa. They also had their own system of writing and weights and measures. Some communities had become renowned for their plank-built boats. They had no calendar, but they counted the years by moons and from one harvest to another. However, these communities exhibited uneven technological development. Settlements along the coastal areas, which had been exposed to foreign trade and cultural contacts such as Manila, Mindoro, Cebu, southern Mindanao, and Sulu, seemed to have attained a more sophisticated technology. In 1570, for example, the Spaniards found the town of Mindoro fortified by a stone wall, which is over 14 feet thick and defended by armed moros. They also found Manila similarly defended by a wall along its front with pieces of artillery at its gate. These reports indicate that the Filipinos in Manila had learned to make and use modern artillery. On the other hand, in the interior and mountain settlements, many Filipinos were still living as hunters. They gathered forest products in order to trade with the lowland and coastal settlements. The pre-colonial Filipinos were also still highly superstitious. The Spaniards also did not find temples or places of worship. Although the Filipinos knew how to read and write in their own system, this was mainly used for messages and letters. They did not develop a written literary tradition at that time, which would have led to a more systematic accumulation and dissemination of knowledge, a condition that is necessary for the development of science and technology. Furthermore, because of the abundance of natural resources and generally sparse population, there seemed to have been little pressure for invention and innovation among the early Filipinos. The beginnings of modern science and technology in the Philippines can be traced to the Spanish regime. The Spaniards established schools, hospitals, and started scientific research, which had important consequences for the rise of the country's professions. But the direction and pace of development of science and technology were greatly shaped by the religious orders who played a major role in the establishment of the colonial educational system in the Philippines. Consequently, they also influenced the development of technology and promotion of scientific research. 
Due to the shortage of qualified teachers, textbooks, and other instructional materials, primary instruction was mainly religious education, which was generally taken care of by the missionaries and parish priests in the villages and towns. Higher education was provided by schools which were set up by the different religious orders in the urban centers, most of them in Manila. For example, the Jesuits founded the Colegio de San Ignacio in 1595, the Colegio de San Jose in 1601, and the Ateneo de Manila in 1859, while the Dominicans established the Colegio de San Juan de Letran. However, access to these schools was limited to the elite of the colonial society, such as the European-born and local Spaniards, the Mestizos, and a few native Filipinos. On the whole, higher education was also pursued for the priesthood or for clerical positions in the colonial administration. It was only during the latter part of the 19th century that technical and vocational schools were established by the Spaniards. Higher education during the Spanish regime was also viewed with suspicion and feared by the colonial authorities as encouraging conspiracy and rebellion among the native Filipinos. For this reason, only the more daring and persevering students were able to undertake advanced studies. The attitude of the Spanish friars towards the study of the sciences and medicine was even more discouraging. It was not surprising, therefore, that few Filipinos ventured to study these disciplines. Those who did were poorly trained when compared with those who had gone to European universities. Science courses were taught by the lecture and or recitation method, and laboratory equipment was limited and only displayed for visitors to see. So there was little or no training in scientific research. Just as the religious orders provided most of the teaching force and institutions of learning, they also took the lead in technological innovation and scientific research. The Spaniards introduced the technology of town planning and building with stones, brick, and tiles. The construction of the walls of Manila, its churches, convents, hospitals, schools, and public buildings were completed by the 17th century. Towards the end of the 16th century, the religious orders had established several charity hospitals in the archipelago. These hospitals became the setting for rudimentary scientific work during the Spanish regime, long before the establishment of the University of Santo Tomas or UST College of Medicine. Research in these institutions were confined to pharmacy and medicine and concentrated on the problems of infectious diseases, their causes, and possible remedies. Several Spanish missionaries observed, cataloged, and wrote about Philippine plants, particularly those with medicinal properties. By the second half of the 19th century, studies of infectious diseases such as smallpox, cholera, bubonic plague, dysentery, leprosy, and malaria were intensified with the participation of graduates of medicine and pharmacy from UST. At this time, native Filipinos began to participate in scientific research. In 1887, the Laboratorio Municipal de Ciudad de Manila was created by decree. Its main functions were to conduct biochemical analysis for public health, and to undertake specimen examinations for clinical and medical legal cases. The Laboratorio Municipal de Ciudad de Manila also had a publication called Cronica de Ciencias Medicas de Filipinas, showing scientific studies being done during that time. Meteorological studies were promoted by Jesuits who founded the Manila Observatory in 1865. The observatory collected and made available typhoon and climatological observations. 
these observations grew in number and importance so that by 1879, it became possible for Father Federico Faura to issue the first public typhoon warning. The service was so highly appreciated by the business and scientific communities that in April 1884, a royal decree made the observatory an official institution run by the Jesuits and also established a network of meteorological stations under it. In 1901, the observatory was made a central station of the Philippine Weather Bureau, which was set up by the American colonial authorities. It remained under the Jesuit scientists and provided not only meteorological but also seismological and astronomical studies. It is also important to note that the Spaniards exploited the mineral wealth of the Philippine Islands. It developed its agriculture and established industries. Research in agriculture and industry was encouraged by the founding of the Real Sociedad Económica de los Amigos del País de Filipinas, or the Royal Economic Society of Friends of the Philippines, by Governador José Vasco y Vargas, under authority of a royal decree of 1780. Composed of private individuals and government officials, the society functioned somewhat like the European learned societies during the 18th and 19th centuries in a modern national research council. It undertook the promotion of the cultivation of indigo, cotton, cinnamon, and pepper and the development of the silk industry. During the 19th century, it was endowed with funds, which it used to provide prizes for successful experiments and inventions for the improvement of agriculture and industry, to finance the publication of scientific and technical literature, trips of scientists from Spain to the Philippines, professorships, and to provide scholarships for Filipinos. The benefits of economic development during the 19th century were unevenly distributed in the archipelago. While Manila prospered and rapidly modernized, much of the countryside remained underdeveloped and poor. There was also increasing concentration of wealth among the large landowners and poverty and landlessness among the masses. This inequality, coupled with abuses and injustices committed by the Spanish friars and officials, gave rise to Philippine nationalism and eventually the revolution of 1896. At the end of the Spanish regime, the Philippines had evolved into a primary agricultural exporting economy. Progress in agriculture had been made possible by some government support for research and education in this field. But it was largely the entry of foreign capital and technology which brought about the modernization of such sectors, notably the sugar and hemp production. The lack of interest and support for research and development of native industries like weaving, for example, eventually led to their failure to survive the competition with foreign imports. Because of necessity and the social prestige attached to university education, Medicine and pharmacy remained the most developed science-based professions during the Spanish regime. For more details on this lesson, you may read the following papers. Stay tuned for our next lesson on the scientific and technological development in the Philippines. Thank you.